So I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you very much for being with us today for our webinar, uh, <clears throat> Achieving Financial Security, an introduction to the Disability Tax Credit and Registered Disability Savings Plan. I'd like to take a moment and introduce our presenters today. Uh, we have with us Cynthia Min, who is a program manager for Access RDSP with the Disability Alliance of British Columbia. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. We also have Tom Mooney, who is a longstanding volunteer advocate with the Plan Institute uh, BC, who's another of our co-presenting organizations today. Tom, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting us. And my name is Kimberly Hansen. I'm an executive director with Diabetes Canada, and uh, I'm really pleased to be with all of uh, our co-presenters today to share with you an overview of the disability tax credit, uh, how what it is and how you can hopefully access it, <clears throat> the ancillary programs that it is a gateway to, such as the Registered Disability Savings Plan, how you can access those in particular if you're someone living with diabetes or if you're caring for someone who is, and how these tools can support you in achieving financial security. So uh, Tom, maybe you could advance to the next slide, please. Just wanted to make note that this uh, information is um, the intellectual property of the presenting organizations by and large. Um, and that none of this is, of course, medical advice or financial advice, but just guidance that you can use to uh, investigate more on your own behalf. Next slide, please. Today, we'll cover off some history about the Disability Tax Credit and RDSP, particularly as it pertains to uh, people with diabetes. We'll talk about what the DTC and RDSP are, how you can be eligible for them, what the specific eligibility criteria are as they pertain to diabetes, um, how you can access free money through these programs, uh, how you set up an RDSP and who can do so, and then how you can one day uh, withdraw those funds and, um, and, and have them benefit your financial situation. So um, I look forward to having a discussion with you. Throughout this um, presentation, you'll be able to um, ask questions using the chat function at the bottom of your screen or by typing comments in if you're watching on Facebook live and we'll be pleased to answer those. So before we start with the content, we'd like to hear from you a little bit. We would invite you to respond to our first polling question. And we're wondering whether you are someone who lives with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, are you a caregiver or a family member of a person or people who live with diabetes? Are you a healthcare professional or perhaps other? Maybe you're just an interested uh, party and, and that's uh, all great. We're just curious to know a little bit more about you. So we'll give you about um, <clears throat> 20 to 25 seconds to answer those questions and then we'll carry on with our presentation. Please take a moment to vote now, please. Thanks very much, Raquel. There we've got the uh, answers. So many of you are living with type one or you're a caregiver of someone who does. Um, and great to see that we've got some other folks too. And we hope this is gonna be useful for you. We'll be looking for some feedback a bit later on whether this content was helpful. So thanks, Raquel. We'll uh, close that poll and we'll move on. Tom? So I wanted to start with some brief history about how um, Diabetes Canada has been involved in advocating with respect to the disability tax credit. Uh, access for people with diabetes to the DTC is something that Diabetes Canada has been fighting for for many, many years, really ever since the program became available. Um, but that advocacy really ramped up in, in 2017. In May 2017, the Canada Revenue Agency made a small, relatively small, they, they thought, administrative change to how they assessed applications. Um, and that, that change resulted in no adult with type 1 diabetes being eligible for the DTC uh, under that, their new criteria. It wasn't a change 
in the Income Tax Act. It wasn't a change in the official eligibility criteria. It was really just how the analysts at the CRA were interpreting our applications. And it meant that no adult with type one was able to get through to the program, even when they had been qualifying previously. So Diabetes Canada and JDRF worked together to get that change reversed. And that happened in December, 2018. Uh, approvals reverted to normal. So we're seeing now that probably about 55 to 60% of people, of adults with type one diabetes who apply for the uh, disability tax credit under the category of life sustaining therapy now qualify for the program. We'll get into the specifics of that a little bit more in a few minutes, but I'll just say for the record that there was never to our knowledge an interruption in the ability of kids with type 1 diabetes to access the program. And eligibility for adults with type 2 has always been a little bit more complicated. It tends to be related to complications or comorbidities that, that um, you might be living with, as opposed to um, people with type 2 typically do not qualify under the category of life-sustaining therapy. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> Also as a result of Diabetes Canada and JDRF's advocacy, the Disability Advisory Committee was reinstated in, in early 2019. And that's a committee, uh, sorry, it was reinstated in early 2018. And in 2019, it made its first series of recommendations. Uh, the committee is made up of um, advocates and representatives of a variety of patient organizations and, and a variety of conditions. And they're really there to talk to the CRA about how the administration of the DTC could be improved to make it easier for people with all sorts of disabilities to access it. And in their recommendations that were made in 2019, they suggested that everyone who requires life-sustaining insulin therapy, which would be anyone with type 1 diabetes as well as a, a handful of other folks, should automatically qualify for the program. That change hasn't been put into place yet, but we'll continue to advocate that it be implemented. The Senate uh, Social Committee also studied the issue and in June 2018 made a number of recommendations um, that Diabetes Canada also supports. And you can uh, see those by clicking on those links in the presentation deck, which we'll be sharing with you all after the fact via email. Next slide, please, Tom. There are mainly three ongoing issues that Diabetes Canada is concerned with, uh, and, and actually the third one has largely been resolved. So first, we recommend that um, the, the eligibility criteria either be clarified so that everyone with uh, requiring insulin therapy for, for, to sustain life be automatically eligible, or if they choose not to do that, we at least require that carbohydrate counting explicitly be allowed as an eligible activity. And again, we'll get into that more in a few minutes. We also want the eligibility criteria for the DTC to be modernized and, and updated so that um, when healthcare providers, doctors or registered nurses, nurse practitioners are filling out the forms, they're they're answering questions that they can reasonably attest to. Right now they have to say, yes, my patient spends 14 hours a week administering life-sustaining therapy, but they're not with us when we are doing that for the most part. So it's not um, a comfortable process for healthcare providers and that's not fair to them. We want the criteria to be worded more appropriately to something along the lines of, yes, it is, reasonable to assume that my patient is spending that kind of time based on their medical condition. The third issue that we were really concerned about was that it used to be that if um, a person was deemed no longer to be eligible for the disability tax credit, they would be asked to close their registered disability savings plan and and uh, the government could with, take back any contributions it had made. Uh, um, that has been changed. As of budget 2019, the federal government has committed to protecting the RDSP investments and contributions of people um, who, who made those contributions while they were eligible for the DTC, even if their eligibility subsequently changes. So that problem seems to have been addressed and we continue to work on the other two. Next slide, please, Tom. <clears throat> 
So next poll uh, question, please let us know which currently describes your situation today as it relates to the DTC. Are you currently receiving it? Have you made an application but you were denied? Are you perhaps thinking about applying or none of the above? We'll just give you 20 seconds or so to answer these questions. Would love to know kind of where you guys are so that we can um, customize our remarks in the way that's going to be the most helpful for you. Just take another maybe 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. So I see that a bunch of you are considering applying, a bunch of you are currently receiving the benefit, that's fantastic. Hopefully we can provide information that will be helpful and of interest to uh, all of you. So next slide please, Tom. I think I'm handing it to Cynthia now. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Kim. Um, for those of you who don't know, what is the DTC? What is the Disability Tax Credit? Um, in short, it's a non-refundable tax credit that can help reduce the taxes that you or your family members or caregivers owe. Um, what you can do is claim it on your taxes, and the best part about it is that it can be claimed retroactively for up to 10 years, which means if you've paid your taxes uh, for up to 10 years ago, um, and you've also been living with your disability during that time, you could receive money back during that, those years. Let's say you uh, haven't paid as many taxes, um, you haven't paid taxes on your income, it can also be transferred to other family members or caregivers. It also helps individuals access other tax benefits, uh, the Canada's Worker Benefit, uh, if you have a child with a disability, the Child Disability Benefit. It helps you um, yeah, claim other medical expenses. And it is also the qualifying factor to opening an RDSP, which we'll get into later on in the presentation. So, am I eligible? To be eligible, a qualified medical practitioner has to certify that you have a severe and prolonged impairment in mental or physical functioning. What does prolonged mean? A prolonged impairment means that, you, that you've had your disability for at least 12 months. Next slide. And what does severe mean? A severe impairment means that you might be either very restricted or restricted severely in one activity in one of the following categories, in vision, speaking, feeding and preparing food, hearing, walking, eliminating or toileting, dressing, or mental functions necessary for everyday life. But Kim mentioned before that you might have comorbid um, uh, conditions that cause you to be restricted somewhat in two or more of the above activities. In that case, you might also qualify under the cumulative effects of these significant restrictions. And the third way you can qualify is if you need life-sustaining therapy to support vital functions at least three times a week at an average of 14 hours a week. So how can you apply? To apply, you have to fill out this form T2201, available on um, the government website. It's called the Disability Tax Credit Certificate. You fill out the front page of the form on your own or with the help of the support person, and you take the rest of the form to a medical practitioner. It can either be your doctor or other qualified med medical professional, so in some cases a nurse practitioner, to be completed. And how do you apply? What would you apply for? So in most cases with those with type 1 diabetes, you would qualify under life-sustaining therapy because you require insulin therapy or other therapies that support a vital function. 
What we recommend is that you keep a record of how often you require life-sustaining therapy a week. What's included in this application? Well, it is tricky right now. Um, the eligibility criteria is very dependent on, you know, being sure that each activity you put down is for your life-sustaining therapy. And so anything else that kind of, um, you know, might be for other activities might not be counted. So what, are, what activities are eligible? Well, it's monitoring blood sugar, preparing and administering insulin, calibrating or preparing necessary equipment, maintaining a logbook. But there are some things that aren't included. Um, as Kim mentioned before, counting carbohydrates is not included at, the t at this moment. Exercising, the time it takes for you to recover after therapy from hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Meal preparation, the time it takes the insulin pump to deliver insulin attending medical appointments, or shopping for med medication, all of these are considered irrelevant to the form. So when you're applying, make sure that you don't count these hours. And well, you know, maybe I can jump in on this one because uh, this is a log that I have actually used personally. I am someone that lives with type one myself and so I get a lot of questions from folks wondering how a person with type 1 diabetes might be able to kind of meet the 14 hour per week requirement of uh, the, under the category of life sustaining therapy. <clears throat> so 14 hours a week would work out to about 130 minutes or so a day. And when you break it down and think about uh, standard therapy for type 1, it's really not that hard. Um, and I should say that this is a log for, um, you know, a, a standard person with type one who isn't sick. Obviously, if you're having a sick day, if you're fighting DKA, then then this could be much much greater. Um, I should also note that when uh, if you are a caregiver of a child with type one, the time that the child is is spending going through therapy as well as the time that their their parent or caregiver spends administering that therapy can both be counted so it's much easier typically for people to meet the eligibility criteria uh, for a child with type 1 but even an adult with type 1 really can relatively easily easily meet the criteria when you think about testing your blood sugar you know every time you go to test it you need to be washing your hands, you need to be changing your lancet, you need to be perhaps uh, swabbing with an alcohol swab, uh, taking the time to load your meter, all of that, that can really add up. Um, there's the number of times that you might dose insulin in a day. Um, you're allowed to count time that you might spend treating a high or a low blood sugar. So actually taking the insulin or the glucose to treat those, um, you're allowed to count the time it takes to test for ketones. Um, you're certainly allowed to count the time that you spend logging and analyzing trends in your blood sugar readings. And if, if you're anything like me, that's an almost daily task that uh, I'm undergoing at least right now because in, uh, you know, in the context of this pandemic being locked down, my insulin needs have really been changing. And so I'm having to look at the patterns a lot more and make dose adjustments. So um, it doesn't take that long to reach the um, amount of time needed. And uh, this, this is not a log that obviously is meant to be prescriptive or should be copied, but it's just meant to give you some guidance as to how um, in your particular case, you might need it. And, and so um, in preparation to talk to your healthcare professional about an application, you might want to start to log some of these activities, all of which are the eligible activities. Just make sure that you do not talk about the time you spend carb counting because that will result in your application being denied. Over back to you to Cynthia, thanks. Thank you so much, Kim. I think that's a valuable, um, you know, some valuable advice and perspective to add to the conversation. Um, and it's exactly that. 
before you get going again, I've got a couple quick questions that I'm just seeing. Uh, maybe I'll just take a quick moment to address them. Mm -hmm. So um, Kaylin's asking why time exercising doesn't count when it's part of managing the condition and blood sugar control. It's an excellent question. And I really disagree with the fact that it doesn't get to count. Um, but it's it's a, a standard requirement across the Income Tax Act that that can't count because um, I think because they're concerned that it would really open up the floodgates. Um, it, you could say the same thing about preparing healthy foods, like how do you manage diabetes without factoring in how you're eating? Um, and so really don't agree with these criteria, but they are the current eligibility criteria. Um, Somebody else, Jen, has a question about whether changing pump or CGM sites counts. Yes, it does. So if you're uh, not taking injection therapy, you can count the time that you spend changing, loading a pump or applying a CGM sensor. You can count the time that you spend scanning that sensor. You can't count the time that it takes to prime a pump. Um, and you, just the same as for no apparent reason, you can't count the time that it takes you to recover from a low, even though you can count the time it takes you to ingest the sugar. It's very, very um, arbitrary and dumb. And uh, you know we've made that point abundantly to the CRA, but they don't really care. Um, another question from Facebook. What if you want a Libre but can't afford it? That's another awesome question for uh, probably another discussion. A couple of provinces are now covering Libres for some folks, Ontario and Quebec in particular, but I would um, invite you to, uh, if you've got more questions, reach out to info at diabetes.ca or call our info line at 1-800-BANTING, B-A-N-T-I-N-G, who can offer you some tips on how you can increase coverage on that. And um, somebody else wants some information about claiming their medical costs for type two. And so we'll be happy to share that. Just make sure that we can see your email address or email us at info at diabetes.ca so that we can be sure to respond to you. And then last question, and we'll keep going for a while. Um, has the time to treat high and low blood glucose levels changed? Uh, Brenda thought that it was not eligible. So um, it, it is not a change. There's been no change to eligibility criteria, but the technical rules say that you can count the time that you spend, as I mentioned, treating a high or a low, but not the time you spend recovering from it. So they don't care how long it takes us to feel well again, or even be capable of say driving a vehicle again, but they, they will allow us to say, oh, I had to, I had to take an extra injection or I had to stop what I was doing and go take some sugar tabs. Okay, sorry about that, Cynthia. Back to you. No worries at all. I think that, you know, what you said too about exercising is it is sort of um, exercising is not a relevant criteria for any of the categories. So that includes, you know, like walking, dressing or feeding. Um, and that um, that can be a really tough thing because of course, you know, people who are, are restricted or, um, you know, time, time that it takes to exercise, um, that is included in a lot of people's um, recovery for any, any type of disability. But unfortunately, I think, you know, it is not, um, you know, considered a, a basic activity. And, um, and I think that because of the disparity between people's experiences, it, uh, it's currently not being included, but that is a very tough thing, I think. So I think that the best, um, as Kim said, the best thing to do, um, best way to have an open discussion with your medical practitioner is to log down in your book how long it takes you every day. It could be a weekly log book. It could be any you know, specific time that you have. And you take this log book to your medical practitioner and you talk about your situation and severity of your disability. Um, and if you're living with a, uh, comorbid conditions, what you might consider is that there are other medical practitioners that can help with your form. Um, for all sections, a doctor or nurse practitioner will, will be able to help you. Vision, if you have any loved ones that have impairments in vision, optometrist, in hearing, audiologist, walking, dressing, feeding, occupational therapists, walking, physiotherapists, or performing mental functions in necessary and everyday life, psychologists, and speaking speech language pathologists. So there are other options out there for you or your loved ones. Be specific, write down in your logbook 
what ex how long exactly each activity takes. And remember that eligibility uh, for the DTC is based on the effects of the impairment, but not on the medical condition itself. So it's not enough for your doctor to just say, okay, um, this person requires life-sustaining therapy. You do have to include that, those examples, and that's another you know, barrier right now to people getting uh, the disability tax credit. So um, just remember that the detail is required and that might be a reason why you're getting a denial. Um, the medical practitioners do charge a fee when completing a form or they are allowed to and that's not regulated. So if this is a concern, speak to your medical practitioner and see if that can be accommodated. Um, but if it's not, you can uh, potentially claim this as a medical expense uh, when you file your tax return. All right, now you've submitted your application. What happens now? Well, it may take three to four months for the CRA to make a decision and they're gonna mail you a notice of determination. But let's say it's been a month or two and you haven't heard back. What might be the case is that your doctor has received an additional questionnaire and they're asking your doctor for med more medical information. So I would at this point check in with your medical practitioner to see if that's the case. There are some possible responses that you could have gotten if you received that letter notice of determination. You could be approved for a number of years and most often you might be approved for five years or, um, or 10 years or one year. Um, even people with permanent conditions we often see are only approved for a certain number of years and have to reapply after that approval has expired. Or you might be declined. Um, remember that if you are declined, you have options. So you can either go to your medical practitioner and add additional medical information and send that to the CRA, or you can file formal objections. So you can either write a letter to the Chief of uh, Appeal Center or you can take it to an appeals court. If you have to reapply, uh, if you need help with your application, if you uh, have a denial at all, and you need some more support, uh, we at Access RDSP are here to support you and we'll provide our information at the end of this presentation as well. Okay, and that's it for my section. Um, I'll send it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, my name is Tom Mooney, and, and I'm a member at Plan Institute. Uh, so I've actually been engaged with Plan for a, about 10 years doing presentations on the RDSP. Um, the RDSP is a federal government plan uh, that is really a long-term investment account for people with disabilities or people that qualify for the um, disability tax credit. Um, Contributions are not tax deductible, which makes it more similar to the registered education savings plan in that um, the, there's a, a government contribution component to it and the investment grows tax-free inside the plan. It does not affect any other uh, disability, uh, federal disability benefits. And for the most part, it doesn't uh, affect a person's uh, qualifying for provincial disability benefits, the PWD, for example, in British Columbia. And you can have up to $200,000 in per personal contributions, and you can receive up to $90,000 in government contributions plus the interest earned. So over the life of a plan, it can theoretically uh, grow to uh, say a half a million dollars. And that uh, lump sum asset that is held by a person with disabilities um, is uh, sheltered from disqualifying them from uh, provincial disability benefits. And the next slide. Uh, to be eligible, uh, must be a resident of Canada and hold a social insurance number. Uh, and it must be open before the end of the calendar year where the beneficiary turns 59. And the qualifier for the uh, registered disability savings plan is that disability tax credit. This plan was developed uh, a little more than 10 years ago. And um, rather than trying to write qualifiers for the registered disability savings plan, they just said, if you qualify for the disability tax credit, you qualify to open an RDSP. 
Next slide. Uh, the free money that's available, uh, you can receive up to $70,000 in disability savings grant. Uh, and that's matching money. It's based on the amount of money that the individual or the individual's family contributes to the plan. And there's also a $20,000 available in disability savings bonds. Uh, and that's money that the federal government will contribute to a plan without the individual or the individual's family uh, contributing to the RDSP. And that's uh, very important for uh, low income families and individuals that may not see the uh, benefit of having an RDSP because they can't contribute anything themselves. You can open a plan, uh, not put any money in, and over 20 years receive that $20,000 in disability savings bonds. Uh, it's based on uh, the individual's uh, income, and so the, you have to have your uh, income tax on file for the two years prior. And for some adults with disabilities that have no earned income, they may not see the benefit of filing an income tax return. So there, there are many adults in Canada uh, that are on provincial disability benefits that aren't uh, filing income tax but they must file an income tax so that they have um, uh, an in income tax threshold to qualify for some of these uh, uh, money that the federal government will contribute. And grants and bonds can only be received up to the year that the individual turns 49. You know, in a previous slide, we said that you can open a plan up to the age of 59. And for some people that are receiving disability benefits, the advantage of that is to uh, shelter the, the lump sum uh, income from disqualifying them from provincial benefits. And the next slide. So the money that the federal government will contribute uh, based on a, an individual's income up to uh, $97,000 each year is the federal government will contribute three to one on the first $500 uh, two to one on the next uh, $1,000. Um, and uh, th that's a total of $3,500 in matching, uh, in, in matching uh, contributions. And that, that uh, income amount of $97,000, if you have a registered disability savings plan for a child, it's based on the parent's combined income. And then when that child becomes an adult at 19, it will uh, be based on that individual's income. And even for high earning, uh, high earning individuals or uh, high earning parents of children with disabilities, um, if their income is more than $97,000, the federal government will still contribute dollar for dollar up to a thousand dollars each year and that's uh, 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 much more generous than what the registered education savings plan contributions are and we'll go to the next slide and this is the uh, Canada disability savings grant and that's the federal government's contribution to uh, individuals that have a income of less than forty eight thousand dollars a year it will be prorated for people with incomes between 31,000 and 48,000. Um, but individuals that have an income less than 31,711 uh, a year, they will receive the full $1,000 uh, grant. And that grant is paid up to a maximum, lifetime maximum of 20,000. So for an individual that whose income may fluctuate, some years be greater than 31,000 and some years be less, um, over the, the span of the lifetime of the plan, they can receive up to $20,000. Tom, before you move on, we've got one question. Yep. This, uh, this uh, viewer is asking, if I qualify for the RDSP, is annual income both mine and my husband's? Uh, no, for for a married couple, it's the adult, it's the individual's income, and for a child, it's the combined parents' income. Great, thanks, Tom. And 
Uh, we go to the next slide. So the, the bond amounts will be paid automatically. Uh, in my daughter's case, uh, she's an adult with disabilities and we contribute sometime in the early part of the year. And uh, usually 30 days or 60 days later, uh, the federal government's matching portion magically shows up. In years that we didn't contribute early in the year, somewhere in, uh, in March or April, she usually receives the government's $1,000 contribution because her income is below 31,000. And the grant, the grant amounts can be received by making contributions for previous years. So as uh, Cynthia had mentioned that the disability tax credit can be retroactively claimed for back to 10 years. Likewise, the matching contributions and even the free $1,000 a year that the federal government will put into an RDSP can be retroactively claimed back to 10 years. The RDSP has been around for a little more than 10 years now, so uh, it doesn't go back to the beginning. But it's, uh, it's, it's fairly important for people that qualify for uh, for this program to, if even if they don't have the ability to make contributions this year, if they open up, up, qualify for the disability tax credit and open an RDSP, even without making any sizable contributions, um, they will receive that thousand dollars a year retroactively for 10 years uh, into the plan. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, the government will put in a maximum of 10,500 in any one year. So if you open a plan today, but you're, you're rec you can retroactively contribute for the previous 10 years, you may not be able to get all of those matching grants and bonds in the first year that it's open, but eventually over uh, two or three years, you will be able to eventually get the matching and the $1,000 bond or the $1,000 grant for previous years. Great. Um, we've got two questions I just wanted to interject with. One yep. from Ali, who's wondering if it'll be possible to receive a copy of this presentation that is replayable. So yes, thanks for that question. I mentioned that we would share this presentation deck by email afterwards with our, our participants, but I should also have said we'll be uh, posting this to Diabetes Canada's YouTube channel, and that will include a full replay of this webinar plus a link to the presentation deck. That should be up by early next week at the latest, so you'll be able to revisit this or share this with whomever you'd like. Uh, the next question is from Kristen, who's wondering, Tom, how does one qualify for the bonds? Um, the the uh, can, I, can we go back to the previous slide that shows the amount for the bonds? Oh, I had one. Um, so the grant the grants are uh, eligible for uh, income up to ninety seven thousand, and then the next slide shows the the uh, the the Canada Disability Savings Grant of um, $1,000 a year, the bond amount per year is $1,000. And that is uh, automatically paid into uh, an RDSP that's opened at a financial institution. Um, and part of the process of applying for that is allowing the RDSP organization within the government access to your CRA records. And if your income is below that threshold of $31,711, you would receive the full $1,000 bond for that year. If your income fluctuates, say for example, if you uh, created an RDSP this year and you retroactively qualified for the previous 10 years, but had fluctuating income, you would get um, a bond of $1,000 for the years that your income was below 31,000 and you would get a partial bond if your income was between 31 and 48. If your income was over 48,000, you wouldn't receive any bond for that year, but it's automatically paid into the plan, just like magic. Thanks, Tom. Now we've got a follow-up to that question and then one more question. So the follow-up is, if someone's been eligible uh, since 2013 for the RDSP, but only started contributing this year, how many years would that person need to max out their contribution in order to catch up on the max grants from the government? Um, 
the max grants is uh, um, previous slide shows the maximum grants of $3,500 per year. So you could do the math. Now your retroactive contributions, you can probably only contribute for about three years at a time. If you did three times 1500, approximately $4,500 would get you the maximum uh, retroactive for that year, which would be, you know, a little over $10,000. Um, and it may take you a couple of years to contribute. There are calculators available on the RDSP plan website that can help you uh, calculate that, or you can do some longhand arithmetic. It can be a little bit, a little bit uh, complicated, but that would be a specific question. Okay, thank you, Tom. The next question is, how many contributions can someone make annually to an RDSP? Um, from this person's understanding, it's Kaylin, um, they can make as many contributions as they want this year, but the government will only contribute so much. Right, so for somebody who, who continuously contributes each year um, to enjoy the, the maximum amount of federal government input, all you need to contribute is $1,500. So for example, for my daughter, uh, uh, we contribute as a family $1,500 to her plan to receive the maximum $3,500 of government matching. If I was to contribute $3,000 this year, she would receive the $3,500, but she wouldn't, you couldn't carry it over to the next year. So, and so for retroactive years, it would be the same sort of annual amount for each of the years of retroactivity that you have. Is that right? Right. So I think, I think uh, sort of a rule of thumb would be to contribute uh, probably no more than $4,500 to get previous years uh, retroactive. But that's a, an, a specific arithmetic question that somebody would have to work out on a piece of paper. Okay, um, two more questions and then we'll let you carry on, Tom. Yeah. So uh, Lila's wondering who she should contact to start the RDSP contributions as of this year. Um, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll get to a more specific on a future slide on that. I think the, 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 the plans are available through most major financial institutions and now even some of the um, uh, independent financial advisors have the availability of creating an RDSP through their uh, uh, institutions um, and most of the major credit unions as well. And I think it's important for somebody to uh, work with a, a financial advisor uh, that they have a relationship with, either an existing relationship or to establish a relationship with uh, somebody that you can work with, because this is a long-term investment plan. Good advice, Tom. Thank you. Uh, last question. Joan's wondering, um, Joan qualified for the DTC until she reached age 18. Since becoming an adult, she's no longer eligible for the DTC and is wondering, will her RDSP remain intact, uh, even though she no longer qualifies. And, and I think uh, I, I made reference to this earlier as one of the issues that Diabetes Canada was advocating in respect of. As of budget 2019, the federal government committed to protecting intact the RDSP contributions of anyone who did legitimately qualify for the DTC even if they subsequently stop qualifying. So the answer to Joan's question is that RDSP should absolutely remain intact. Uh, Tom, Cynthia, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that before we move on? Yeah, um, sorry, you go, Tom. No, I was gonna say, you go ahead first. Okay, um, I wanted to say that, um, you know, if you, uh, are 18 and still want to renew, I think it's a good idea to renew your DTC um, even, when you're, even when you're an adult, just so you can still continue getting grants and bonds because what essentially happens is that your account is um, frozen, so no individual contributions can be made, no contributions from the government will be able to be made, and you basically want to keep your money in there for about 10 years. And before, um, you know, that money can be available to you if you're if you no longer have DTC eligibility. Um, what I'll also say too is that even though budget 2019 that was proposed, um, it's not going to be in legislature for you know 
a bit of time, I think around 2021 uh, is when we're expecting it to be, uh, to be um, a, a process that everyone knows about. Um, so right now, uh, all of these um, uh, allowances are kind of in transition. So if you lost DTC eligibility before 2019, this might not apply to you. So you might um, have had your RDSP closed and you might have had to, you know, still um, ask for more time to regain DTC eligibility. Um, whereas those who lost eligibility since 2019, that's when all the transitions are sort of being made. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to continue on to back to the uh, back one slide? Yes, yeah, so the retroactive grants and bonds are paid automatically like magic. And uh, you can only access the, the grants and bonds up to the year that the individual turns 49. And so that's where you can still make contributions after the age of 49 up to the age of 59 but you don't enjoy any uh, retroactive grants and bonds. And I've made this presentation for different community living agencies uh, around the province over the last 10 years. And there was a lot of individuals that uh, were maybe living in supported living or group home situations in their mid forties. And for those individuals, it was really important to open the RDSP and get the thousand dollars a year retroactive that the federal government was contributing, even though these individuals couldn't make uh, contributions themselves, because if they wait it till their age of 50 or 51, they wouldn't, they would lose the retroactive uh, aspect of this plan. And the federal government will put in a maximum of uh, 10,500 in any one year for the grant. In addition to that, an additional $11,000 of the matching bonds that they contribute. So when you when you uh, have a look at uh, your own situation, if you're going to plan on creating a plan and retroactively claim, you can use those amounts to calculate how much personal contributions you would have to make in order to attract that government grants and bonds. And we'll go to the next slide. And so who can uh, set up an RDSP? For a minor, a parent or legal guardian can. And for an adult, the holder and beneficiary can be the same person, although you may have an a adult with uh, intellectual disabilities that uh, has a parent or guardian be the holder of the plan for them. Because there is that uh, competence, it depends on the nature of the disability, whether it impacts uh, cognitive ability, every beneficiary should have a power of attorney. And what is the holder? The holder of the RDSP is someone who's responsible for the following tasks, uh, managing the RDSP, arranging for the contributions, uh, working with the financial institution or representative, and choosing and approving investments the RDSP has a wide range of investment options. You can have a simple interest uh, earning account, or you can have an account that has um, um, mutual funds, a wide a range of mutual funds. And even uh, you can have individual stocks or, or other uh, exotic type investments. Uh, anything that you can hold in a, a an a registered retirement savings plan is probably available uh, to be held in an RDSP. And then the other um, uh, responsibility of the uh, account holder is supervising the withdrawals later when the uh, account has uh, matured and receiving those payments. And the next slide. So the 10 year repayment rule, um, and that's for when you start making withdrawals, you have to repay to the federal government any of the contributions that they made in the previous 10 years. And this may also occur if a plan is collapsed due to ineligibility for the DDC. And when this RDSP was originally developed a little more than 10 years ago, it was, um, uh, it, it was the, the rule at the time that if a plan collapsed, 
the money had to be paid back right away. But uh, subsequently, the, the RDSP has evolved to the point now where they are aware that some people's situations may uh, fluctuate, their disability may improve at some point, and they may disqual be disqualified for the disability tax credit. But if there's a likelihood that the individual's circumstances may change again, and they may requalify in subsequent years, as Cynthia used the word frozen, the plan can be frozen, and I'm not sure that the amount of time that it can be held but for a year or two, you can uh, freeze a plan and then perhaps requalify for the disability tax credit and then continue on. But when you start making withdrawals, you pay back the three to one that you uh, uh, received in the, um, in the government's contributions for the money's de deposit in the previous 10 years. Um, if there's any un any Unvested grants or bonds within the RDSP, um, you're not eligible to, to withdraw without penalty. And basically, what that says is that you can't, if you if you if you've had a plan for 13 years, you can't take the money that is uh, matured to, that you're fully vested in. Uh, this is a long-term savings plan, and it's not really intended for taking out uh, little bits of money here and there. And withdrawals are restricted and the RDSP is not something that you can uh, dip into without a penalty. And it's an intended to be a 30 year plus savings plan. So to enjoy the maximum government contributions, if my daughter contributes $1,500 a year for 20 years, she would receive the $70,000 in federal government money plus you'd receive $20,000 in 1,000 per year for 20 years. And then 10 years of letting that uh, money mature, and then she can start making withdrawals without uh, repaying any of the federal government money. And once you start uh, making withdrawals, you can decide how best to spend the money. And that's uh, another aspect of, of this plan as it relates to people that are receiving other government disability benefits is that um, it, it, there's no uh, um, limit on the types of uh, things that you can purchase with the money from the plan. Uh, and the next line about open a registered, at, at, oh, what's that? Um, withdrawals, oh, uh, and you can open a registered education savings plan as well as an RDSP for somebody under the age of 25 and build up emergency savings fund. So I, th I think that the bottom line is that um, this is a good long-term investment plan for somebody, but it's uh, important to have uh, an overall financial plan because although you can have uh, a lot of money sitting in an RDSP, it's not something that you can easily access a thousand or a few thousand dollars for an emergency. You'd have to make your financial plans around setting aside some money outside of this plan. And the next slide shows the RDSP scenario and calculator. And with this plan, it can show you um, either with making very modest personal contributions each year, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year, or no personal uh, uh, contributions a year based on the individual's income, how much would likely accumulate in a plan over a 30 year period. And there is an incentive of $150. When I said that you can receive uh, up to um, $20,000 in federal government free money into a plan, regardless of uh, any personal contributions. And really, um, you know, a lot of financial institutions may have a requirement that you need to deposit $25 to open a plan. And so there does have to be a, something there to, to kickstart the plan to, to open it up. Once the plan is open, the federal government will contribute $1,000 a year but as an incentive, Plan Institute provides a one-time $150 grant to eligible BC residents. 
Um, and that was developed through, uh, there's been an endowment 150 pretty much since the beginning of the, of the uh, RDSP from uh, some foundations in the, in the BC area. And children with a disability or 17 years old or younger uh, can open an RDSP and be eligible for this $150 grant regardless of their family's income. And for adults with a disability, it's intended for low uh, income individuals who are an adult that uh, should have an RDSP and it gives them $150. And that $150 will attract three to one federal government contribution plus the additional $1,000 each year going forward. And so for more information on that, you can go to the RDSP. And there are a wide range of um, uh, information available through Plan Institute and through these websites that are listed on the screen. Tom, we have a, another question from one of our viewers who's wondering, uh, once somebody is eligible to access the funds that they've saved, so they've, they've waited the required time, et cetera, uh, she's wondering how, how one accesses that money. Do you just go to the bank that you've set the RDSP up with? Uh, and they transfer the amounts to you, or how does that work? Um, well, you you have the ability to to take the money out at uh, at some point and then pay back the federal government's contributions if you're if you didn't wait that ten years after receiving all of their contributions. But basically, um, the for for a plan that say for example matured over thirty years and received a bunch of federal government uh, money, if the federal government money if the federal government contributions exceed the personal contributions, um, the, the withdrawals are, are in the form of uh, uh, lifetime disability assistance payments. And that would be like an annuity where you take level payments over uh, the lifetime of the plan and receive basically a, a, a fixed monthly income. If the personal contributions exceed the federal government's contributions, um, then you have the ability to take lump sum payments in addition to um, taking a, a monthly uh, income from the plan. Um, the RDSP has been around for a little over 10 years and we don't really have a lot of people that have experienced the withdrawals and, and, and what's that, what's that, what those amounts are like. But I know that there's several plans now that, that have uh, a lump sum investment of over $100,000. And for those individuals, they've got another 20 years to go and their plans will likely be three or $400,000. And when those plans start to mature, that will have a significant monthly income that the individuals will be able to take from the plan. Um, so Got to be reassuring to the plan holders. Yeah, another thing that I want to really uh, stress here is that the personal contributions that, that are made to the plan, even if the RDSP is uh, disallowed at some future date, an individual in the family will never lose their personal contributions. They'll always have those. The federal government's contributions, if a plan collapses, would have to be repaid. But any interest or investment income that was derived from the personal contributions and the uh, federal government's money, uh, that income growth resides with the plan holder. Or the Tom, plan if I can just interject quickly there. Uh, I had a conversation with the parliamentary secretary uh, for revenue the week before the pandemic hit. And he confirmed for me that be since the, the federal government announcement in budget 2019, the federal government and the CRA is administering as though it were passed into law, the change that protects even the government's contributions to an RDSP, even if the person subsequently becomes ineligible. So not only are your own contributions now protected, so are those of the federal government that were made while you did qualify. So that's, that's new and uh, I've had it confirmed from the top of the house. Right, and that, that's for a plan that continues to, like if a plan is frozen, but if a plan is collapsed and people are taking money out, you would still have to repay the federal government's uh, for the previous 10 years. 
And I guess some people may have a plan that is 11 or perhaps even close to 12 years old now. Those first two years of contributions from the federal government now are vested with the plan beneficiary. Great. So I see we're just about at uh, time for this session. The hour's gone quickly. Uh, be happy to take any further questions that any of our viewers might have. You also have our contact information and can absolutely reach out to any of us after the fact with any more questions that you have. Um, but uh, do feel free to reach out. And maybe while you're thinking, I'll just uh, ask uh, my teammate to start the last poll. We just would love to get a sense from you as to whether the information that we've all shared with you today has been helpful. So please just take a minute to give us your feedback before uh, you go off and have the rest of your Thursday. Great. Well, Really glad that most of you found it helpful. If, um, if, it's, if you've still been left with questions, again, please don't hesitate to reach out. And um, uh, I see that there's one last question. What happens if the contributor passes away before 30 years of contributing? Uh, Cynthia, Tom, do you have an answer? Um, the, contribute, the, the, uh, the plan is based on the beneficiary, which is the person with disabilities. Uh, anybody can contribute to a plan. Sometimes it is the individual and sometimes it's the ind individual's family. Uh, once the contributor contributes the money, they've lost control of it. It, be it, it becomes the asset of the, uh, of the plan beneficiary. If a beneficiary passes away, the assets in the plan become uh, a part of their estate. And um, the, the, the personal contributions that were made plus any vested federal government money become uh, uh, part of that individual's estate. Great, thanks Tom. So just a final reminder, we will be sharing today's presentation deck with all of the registered participants. We'll also be sharing this recording on Diabetes Canada's YouTube channel, um, probably around the 1st of June. So do feel free to check back and you'll be able to access there a full recording of our discussion today, plus this presentation deck and uh, continue to reach out to us with any questions. Really would like to thank Cynthia and Tom for their valuable insights today and to our partners, uh, the Plan Institute and the BC Disability Alliance for, uh, for collaborating with us to bring this webinar. Thanks to all of you for participating. It's been a great discussion. Thank Have you very much. Thank you everyone.